and welcome to Tech Latest from Nikkei Asia, where we bring you the freshest updates from the technology sector in Asia. I'm your host, Katie Creel, and in this week's episode, we're talking to our other host, Shotaro Tani, about Japan's solar ambitions. Welcome to the show, Shotaro. My pleasure. So Japan used to account for a major part of the global market for solar panels, I think around half. Um, Something that I think a lot of people now maybe have forgotten, given that China is so much more dominant. Um, What happened? Like, how did one, how did Japan get to such a strong position and how did it lose it? So we have to actually go all the way back to 1973 to talk about this. So, Kate, did you know what happened in 1973? Uh, The Yom Kippur War. Yes. And... (laughs) Did you know that because I wrote it in the script? <laughs> you may have given me a hint. <laughs> right. So what happened, just to explain to our listeners, what happened was there was a 1973 oil crisis which stemmed from the Yom Kippur War. So what happened was the Arab nations who were producing oil, they basically embargoed oil exports, which obviously affected um, supplies to Japan as well. So the government at the time came up with this thing called the Sunshine Project, which was like a research and development plan for um, new looking into new energy forms to reduce Japan's dependence on oil. And they were looking at all sorts of new technologies like wind, geothermal. They were even looking at hydrogen. Um, And of course, one of the technologies that they were looking at was solar. And so on this program, there was a lot of um, R&D done on solar and Japan became one of the earliest adopters of solar energy, which kind of led to it having more than 50% share of production in solar panels up until the early 2000s. And then what happened was, and this is according to Japan's economy ministry, by the way, they have a you know a document outlining their next generation solar battery strategy, and they go into the histories and whatnot. But so according to this document, is that domestic producers of solar panels kind of outsource production to places with cheap labor, which obviously includes China, mm. and didn't really do any research and development into the area. And the technology in making solar panels became kind of commoditized, which is basically which basically means that anyone who has the right machinery could, you know, get in the game. So that was on the private sector side. On the public sector side, the economy ministry admits that it didn't really kind of introduce any policies that allow Japanese manufacturers to compete on the global stage. So the outcome of all of that was that China was able to steal the march and has now basically cornered all aspects of solar panels, all the way from the base materials to the finished product. So what kind of policy should the economy ministry have introduced? Um, And as you said, there's a lot of economic factors, like cost of labor, working against Japan. What could the ministry or the government more broadly have done? So it's not that Japan didn't introduce any support schemes to these manufacturers. There was, um, well, I mean, it was mostly on the adoption side where there was this thing called the FIT mechanism where the electricity produced by solar panels could be sold at a fixed price. Right. So that allowed, you know, a lot of investors come in and basically, you know, it, these were expensive at the time, but basically mm. cover their costs and still make a profit. Um, so there, there was that. But then beyond that, I don't think there was anything in particular that kind of supported the actual manufacturing of the solar panels in the country. And there, there is this added challenge that um, silicon, which you need to actually, you know, make the solar panels, China mm. is China is a massive producer of that. So they had the massive cost advantage. So again, it's not, it's not that the Japanese government didn't do anything. But even if they did something, it might have been a bit hard to um to beat China in 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 this field. Yeah, and that's a story we've seen in so many other supply chains as well. It's just China yeah. has so much dominance baked in that it's hard to uh, yeah exactly get past it. But now Japan feels like it might have a chance by getting into a radically new type of solar panel called I hope I can say this correctly perovskite solar panels. Yeah, you, you, that, yeah, <laughs> something something like job. that. Yeah, yeah. So what makes these so special or different from conventional solar panels? So perovskite solar panels, they are much, much thinner and lightweight than the regular solar panels that are made from polysilicon. So they're like 20 times thinner and 10 times lighter. And uh, because they are thin, it's easy to bend as well. So, So the benefit from all of this is that you can place them in places where you can't really place regular solar panels because they're obviously heavy and quite, you know, sturdy. So you think about, you know, building walls and windows um, in cities. Right. Um, you can potentially, you know, plaster uh, these perovskite solar panels onto those um, places. So what that does is it potentially allows cities to become like a major solar power plant. 
And that matters to Japan because it is running out of land area and needs to place the regular um, silicon-based solar panels. So that's on the technical side. Then there's this kind of geopolitical angle to all of this as well, in that perovskite solar panels use iodines as its main ingredient. And that is something that Japan has in abundance. So it's the oh. world's second largest producer after Chile. Did not know that. So because of this, some hope that Japan, and if this technology takes off around the world, the, the entire world can really escape from China's solar panel dominance. That would be a huge change to the market for sure. I think the whole world has been kind of grappling with the question of what do we do with all these Chinese solar panels disrupting our own markets? Um, yeah, but I mean, to be, uh, credit to them though is, I mean, because China mass produced these solar panels is part of the reason why renewable energy has spread around the world. It's the, it's the cost right. deduction that came from mass producing um, these panels. For, and, that, yeah. and so China really did drive the, the renewable revolution around the world. So, yeah. And not, at home too, they're one of the biggest adopters themselves. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's a deeper question for perhaps another podcast yes. of how much we <laughs> want to dive into the cost question of this. Um, but perhaps Kite solar panels themselves are fairly new. They were developed, I think, first around 2009. Yep. Um, so they're not as mature and not, maybe there's some more kinks to work out compared to conventional solar panels. Yeah, the, the, so there's basically two major technical challenges that it still needs to kind of overcome. So one is durability. Um, conventional solar panels last around 20 plus years, the newer ones perhaps a bit longer. Um, whereas these perovskite solar panels um, in its current technological state only last around 10 years, which mm. is you know kind of understandable because if you look at them, they are basically like you know, paper thin, <laughs> they, they're basically a film. So you, you can see that it's not very sturdy. Um, so what Sekisui Chemical, which is one of the main players in this field is currently doing is they're running a test in Okinawa, is obviously um, the southernmost island uh, in Japan, and they they're prone to loads of uh, hurricanes, and they're prone to well harsh sea breeze. So the Sekisu is basically you know conducting a test to see how how well the perovskite solar panels stand up against those kind of um, nature what what nature throws at it basically. Another one is obviously the power generation efficiency, which is so crucial to these solar panels. Um, so we, we, what that basically means is how well it can transform sunlight into electricity. Um, the current perovskite solar panels have an efficiency rate of around 10 to 15%, which is you know, quite a bit lower than the 20 plus percent for the polysilicon-based solar panels. Having said that, um, in, in lab settings, though, perovskite solar cells were able to achieve an efficiency efficiency rate of 30%. So the technology is there. It's just about how you know you translate that into the real world settings. That makes sense. And I guess it might also depend the trade offs going forward. Like if you can get a efficiency rate of thirty percent, does that make it economical enough to use these, even if the durability is maybe not quite what it is for conventional solar panels? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for example, if you have hundred percent efficiency rate, that would be amazing. Right? Yeah, that would be amazing, <laughs> and people start adopting these in droves. But I, yeah. I don't think the technology is. You know, there just yet. Yeah, I guess we'll have to wait and see how it uh, yeah. unfolds. There's also the commercialization question. Mm -hmm. and, um, how is Japan placed for that? Do you think they have any particular challenges or advantages? I mean, so this is where the, the Japanese manufacturers face the classic chicken or the egg conundrum, right? So companies can't really mass produce, don't want to mass produce and, you know, commercialize this without there being a big enough market because mm -hmm. they need that assurance, right? That people would buy these yeah but without the cost reduction associated with mass production you know people won't adopt it and they won't be like a big enough market for this um so that's a that's the biggest challenge that the japanese manufacturers face i mean the, the currently the cost of generating electricity using perovskite is way way higher than regular solar panels and so the Japanese government is aiming to bring that down to 10 yen per kilowatt hour by 2040 in its best case scenario. So I think that's around 7 cents per, per kilowatt hour. But then you look at the, the conventional solar panels, the global average um, is like 5 to 6 yen and cheapest is around 2 yen. So even if you know the, the perovskite panels do get to that 10 yen per kilowatt hour that the Japanese government is looking at. And that's still in 2040, right? The, the regular right. solar panels are already at, you know, 2 yen in the lowest case scenario. So there's a massive discrepancy still. So the skeptics kind of doubt, you know, whether perovskite can really take off given, you know, the continuing cost disparity. 
Yeah, that's a good question. It always comes down to cost. Yeah, it does. I mean, no one wants to buy expensive stuff, right? Yeah, even when you should. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the critics, um, and you've touched on this a bit about the government wanting to make up for kind of past failures of policy. Um, how serious is government about perovskite solar panels and what are the critics saying about this? Do they Is there broad support for such measures or such support measures or is it more the rapidest case where some people are saying you know, this is too much money being thrown at something that we don't see paying off anytime soon? I mean, so on the government, what, what, the, what the government is thinking, I, I think the Japanese government is, you know, quite mindful of the fact that it, it lost its dominance in the regular solar panels and is, mm-hmm. you know, actually quite determined to not let that happen again with perovskite panels. So there are several support schemes, including one that helps companies when they're looking to establish production facilities. Mm-hmm. So like Sekisui, which I mentioned earlier, that um, they are going to invest $2 billion dollars um to set up a, a factory to producing perovskite panels but half of that cost is going to be covered by the government and the government has this goal of placing solar panels in all government owned buildings and they are prioritizing using perovskite solar panels so they basically you know trying to create a government led um demand basically mm. well, I should probably add that you know China isn't just sitting around doing nothing um <laughs> They they are looking at the technology as well. But what they're trying to do is they're, they're doing this thing called the tandem perovskite solar panel where you mm-hmm. combine the perovskite solar panels with the regular silicon-based solar panels. And what that does is it basically you know bumps up the energy efficiency of the regular solar panels. And this kind of makes sense for China because, you know, that allows them to leverage, really leverage their existing expertise in the conventional solar panels. So that's so that's what they're doing. And some of the experts that I talked to were saying, like, this is probably the way that perovskite kind of spreads around the world. Because when you think about it, there are loads of solar panels around the world that is, you know, reaching its 20 plus years life cycle. Good and so point. you need to replace that. Do you replace that with regular perovskite solar panels or do you replace that with tandem solar panels? As Mm. it stands, the cost and the durability challenge is still there. So it kind of makes sense to replace them with these tandem solar panels. So the Japanese government obviously understands this as well. And so under Japan's previous plans, the tandem perovskite panels weren't really under the government support scheme. But Mm. that is looking likely to change soon as we've kind of reported in our piece. So it's kind of a race against time for Japan to kind of nab this replacement demand in the uh, life cycle of the solar panels. Yeah, and they they probably have to act quite you know rapidly as well if if they were to you know take that market opportunity. That's not something Japan government policy is always known for. Um, but do you think in this case they have the kind of wherewithal and determination? Of the determination, yes. Whether you know they have the the capability capabilities to do it is you know another question, right? I mean, I, one would hope, as as a Japanese person, <laughs> one would hope. So is everyone happy that the government's pushing so hard for this, generally speaking? Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the manufacturers are, you know, happy, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, I obviously chatted to some of the Japanese manufacturers and they were, I mean, they, they definitely felt a sense, or they were saying that the level of support from the government this time around is completely different from what they did do, or rather didn't do. Right. For regular solar panels. But it is a still a very nascent market, right? So China will undoubtedly get involved more seriously at some point. And will Japan be able to compete with the Chinese manufacturers when they have the full backing from the state? I mean, that's something that all the Japanese manufacturers, I, I think, and I felt deep down when inherently quite worried about. But as I said, the Japanese government is serious about not repeating the same mistakes. So... We'll see how it goes, and maybe we can do an episode in 10 years' time to check on the progress. I'm looking forward to that episode very much. (laughs) Thanks, Jotaro. It's been a lovely conversation. My pleasure. That's all for this week's episode. For more of Nikkei Asia's tech coverage, visit asia.nikkei.com. You can also subscribe to our weekly Tech Asia newsletter, which will be delivered to your inbox every Thursday. Thanks again for listening, and check back with us next week for more updates on the tech trends that matter.